So I was gonna talk today about some of the social sciences and humanities approaches to wild horse management, um, because this is just such a almost invisible um, area and we feel like there's some knowledge um, in some of these fields that can contribute to strategy and knowledge about wild horses. Um, so, and, and also thank you, by the way, to Heather and Linda for organizing this and inviting me and it's, uh, it's really an honor to be here. I was not told about the dancing. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't prepared anything. <laughs> so um, as, as Heather said, I'm a, I'm a photographer. I have been involved in horses for a very long time. I used to do pony club and dressage and eventing. Um, I volunteer at Assateague Island. I created the first um, field guide to, the, to those ponies in the Maryland herd, um, now in its third edition. If, you're, if you ever stop uh, by Assateague, drop in the visitor center um, before you go onto the island and you can scoop up one of those guides at the, at the visitor center shop. Um, and I am newly part of the Wild Horse Photography Collective. For my day job, um, I'm at Drexel University in Philly. By the way, I um, my route to work, the Philadelphia Art Museum is in my neighborhood, oh. and I um, <laughs> I commute right through that photo. Of Are you serious? At the top of the steps, and I sometimes work out on the. On Can the I get steps. a photo of you doing that? <laughs> <laughs> I'll arrange it and send it to you. So awesome. Okay. Um, I'm at Drexel University. I'm the executive director of Sustainable Development Strategy, where I think about both how you sort of think about how you turn the large boat that is a big higher ed institution <coughs> to think more about local economic investment as well as climate and sustainability. Um, Christian, my invisible partner right now, is my husband. He is a political theorist and is a professor of political science at Drexel. Um, his uh, research is in human animal studies these days. Um, his background has been in environmental political theory and environmental policy and politics. And he wrote the book on green states and social movements, which sort of concerns how, um, how and whether uh, green social movements um, can thrive or not in various kinds of states. Um, he is also a wildlife photographer who documents Philadelphia's red-tailed hawks. Um, and so together we're in Philly, like I said, we have cats, we like to ride bikes and run and follow the Ben Franklin Parkway urban hawks. Um, and this term, um, this, this, this academic year actually, we have created a uh, honors college symposium at Drexel called Animals in the City, where we are thinking about what does it mean to imagine a, the convivial multi-species city where both humans and non-human animals have what they need to thrive together. Um, so this, this term we are teaching together, of course, um, about dioramas and how, how, how animals are represented in museum dioramas. And in the fall, I taught a course on multi-species art, which was a real blast. Anyway, that's us. Um, I am also really acutely aware that I am all that stands between y'all and lunch. Um, and I <laughs> tried my best to not run over time. Um, one day I came home from Assateague Island with this photo in 2018, and uh, it was so fun. This is the state line fence. Colloquially, it used to be called Udall's Wall, uh, uh, in honor of the former um, Secretary of the Interior. And this is a fence that is meant to keep the Maryland ponies and the Virginia ponies separate. And what you see, <laughs> I mean, the thing about borders, is like one of the most fundamental things about borders is that they're always going to be violated, whether they're physical um, or, or, or borders that are about metaphors and concepts. And this is Sapphire, Sienna Bell, and Chica Linda coming home to Maryland after spending a night in Virginia. Um, and I showed it to Christian, and um, uh, he said, oh, hey, um, Rafi, you ought and I um, are working on creating a a symposium on uh, on borders, um, animals and borders. Here we are. <laughs> so, like, in uh, in the nerd zone of higher ed, um, what you do when you sort of are faced with something like this is you write a paper about it. And so, um, our first uh, published paper together is about bordering at Assateague Island, um, where we um, 
kind of learned um, uh, from talking to the different stakeholders um, that wildness isn't a fixed quality, that it is something that is negotiated between, in the case of Assateague Island, ponies and people. That project is sort of in a case of one thing leading to another. Um, we went um, from there to do a, a, a project uh, based in the concept of mobilities, how things move. Um, and we were thinking about captivity, um, the idea that wild horses are not, I mean, we like to say that they're wild and free, but really they're captives. Um, they're captives in a space that is ample enough for them to thrive. Um, to, to, in most cases, give them all that they need in terms of food and water and companionship and, and play um, uh, and reproduction in, in most cases. Um, but we thought about the immobility of wild horses um, compared to the mobility of climate in the face of climate change with ecosystem ecosystems, plant communities, animal communities, all on the move, while the water underneath the, uh, the HMS, HMAs is also on the move, right? It's being tapped um, for agriculture uses, um, <coughs> and in a lot of cases, really overextended. And so we thought about um, the problem of horses that are stuck in shrinking HMAs while critical things move out from under their feet and called for some imaginative problem solving because we thought that the advocacy, the wild horse advocacy world isn't thinking much more creatively about the climate crisis than the BLM is, right? And so we think that um, some creativity is needed. Um, in Riverside County, California, there is a, a city called Moreno Valley um, where there are some wonderful wild burrows roaming around and we took a a kind of a placemaking um, approach and we literally just submitted this paper yesterday to a human animal studies journal um, and our argument here is that this city offers us a look into what a convivial multi-species city can look like where both humans and burrows are valued um, roundups our roundup paper we have also just finished this up it was presented a couple weeks ago at the western political science association um, this grew out of some liter a literature review that i was doing for a mobilities paper and i was sort of searching the rangeland management science literature and becoming enraged um, and we we um, and i'll talk about that sort of bookmark that point but we talk about roundups as a site where different bodies and different interests come together. And we look at it as, in a, as, as a site where a couple of different effective regimes come into play. In other words, the way emotionality um, plays a part um, in this scene. With wild horse advocates who are accused of being wildly, dangerously emotional um, up against the uh, purported claimed rationality um, of of the BLM and the contractors. Um, and we argue um, for the potential power of, of what the wild horse advocates bring in terms of effective entanglements uh, with wild horses. So let's, let's kind of summarize, we're, we're doing academic research on wild horses, but not as biologists. Um, we are not thinking about the horses as an organism in an ecosystem. Um, but we're taking it from a multi-species perspective. So at wild horses and burrows as actors um, and subjects, um, not just passive ob objects that exist only as part of a background of human life. We think of wild horses and burrows as having um, agency and being political actors in their own right. Um, yeah, so, um, so that's just a, a quick sum up of some of our projects. Right now we're asking what's next since we just submitted the Burrow paper and the Roundup paper. Um, kind of brings me why, um, why I am here today and why I sort of thought that this, this topic might be helpful. Um, wild horses have so few of the kinds of researchers who care about them that you find in ornithology or herpetology. Like, my colleagues at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philly who are doing um, ornithological research are birders and they love birds. And the work that they bring to help us understand birds contributes to the protection and conservation of birds. Um, 
you know, there's some of this in semester courses and veterinary medicine. Um, there's this, even some interesting social science connected to um, people's relationships with domestic horses. But for wild horses, what most of what there is in the literature is land use oriented research with a starting assumption that there are too many of them. We have all heard this. By the way, I, I think that as I go through this presentation, you're gonna hear a lot of points of congruence with some of the other speakers. Um, <clears throat> So people who care about wild horses as wild horses are mostly advocates like those of us in the room who are not scientists. I, th I think some of the predominant scientific um, voices on wild horses that does exist come from people who are invested in exterminating them, um, right? So many, there are many, there's so many animals that find political support from the scientific research in wild horses just not have much of that outside of some of the researchers <coughs> like, like Ross McPhee, um, who are working on some of those questions around evolutionary history and the, and the, the sort of claiming a place, trying to claim a place for modern horses um, on American grasslands. So <clears throat> in our work, we've drawn um, on research by a few folks in social sciences and humanities who are writing about wild horses um, and, and kind of on, they're on team wild horse. Um, there's Jay Sanford Raccoon, who's at the University of Missouri. Um, he did some great work on um, the National Park Service's uh, plans in the 1990s, I don't know if anyone remember that, remembers this, to remove the Ozarks wild horses from the Ozark National Scenic Riverways. Um, he did some great work connecting um, and sort of bringing out the story in which really the, the people of the region connected the horses to their cultural legacy. And that was a, a winning strategy for them and preserving those horses. Um, Claudia Notsky at the University of Lef Lethbridge does some great work on wild horse tourism. Um, Janaki Bhattacharya, who is an ethnoecologist at the University of Victoria, does some really cool, interesting work um, on wild horses in indigenous communities in Western Canada. Uh, that has been super helpful uh, to us as well. She does some really especially cool analysis on the political, a sort of ferality as a political category, not a meaningful ecological category. Um, so wild horses need more champions in the academic scholarship. And so Chris and I are trying to build on the foundation that Raccoon and Natsuki um, Bhattacharya have, have created. Um, so it's gonna share some of the perspectives that we use uh, today. So we draw from, um, environmental politics and political theory, mobility studies, feminist science studies, critical animal studies, um, and science, technology, and society, which is my, uh, my field. Um, STS is about um, taking a critical look at um, the practice and development of science and technology. So I joke that we study scientists in their natural habitats and think about um, what kinds of assumptions do scientists bring into their work? How does it affect the work that they do? Um, when we think about what gets engineered, um, sometimes we think engineering, it's all about progress, but sometimes engineering is about creating designs against um, inclusion uh, and social progress. So coming back to um, rangeland management and science. So I, I mentioned in, uh, in our um, mobilities paper, I had um, done a, a literature search on the, I asked what's out there? What are the rangeland management sciences saying about, uh, about horses? Um, everybody's familiar with the, the system of land grant universities in the US, right? So um, that, we're all about um, developing these ag and agricultural engineering and mining um, schools uh, during the um, uh, 1800s when a lot of these uh, universities were established. I, I went to Penn State, which is William Grant University, um, as an undergrad. Um, that is all about, um, in the case of ag, promoting the interest of of agriculture stakeholders and growing the American agriculture industry. <clears throat> um, so it emerges from mostly the land grant universities where these, where the sort of appropriate researchers are located doing research and teaching. Um, their funding comes from 
uh, federal agencies that prioritizes management, managing public lands or grazing um, with a little bit of concern about um, balancing for ecological issues, but I'll talk about that in a second as well, the sort of the role um, in, in um, political theory and policy about um, those ecological issues. This research works from the, the fundamental premise that there are too many horses. Not only are the horses problematic, but the advocates are very problematic and they are getting in the way of rational solutions. This is a constant thread through the rangeland management literature, the, the sort of how the managers are just stymied by the hysterical women of wild horse <laughs> management, essentially. Um, and this is where the BLM gets its knowledge about wild horses. I'm gonna bookmark that point about the hysterical um, wild horse advocates because that's what kind of, I literally made me scream um, when I reached um, the, an article that was written uh, by two researchers in Burns, Oregon, and I'm gonna come back to that. Uh, yeah, Burns. <clears throat> So this is like where Krishna would be talking. So I'm doing my best to inhabit him um, today. <laughs> he, is, he is our uh, political theorist. Um, so the field of environmental policy, what does this tell us about, like what can we find here about wild horse management? Um, it, does some, it does some pretty helpful contextualizing, I think. Um, folks who study environmental policy are gonna remind us that the, there is a, there is an incredibly strong and durable historical legacy in these resource management agencies that stretches back to the 19th and, and earlier 20th centuries. If you recall, um, probably no one in this room actually recalls the state of the American environment in the 1800s. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Nobody remembers? <laughs> um, so the deal is that there was just untrammeled resource development. And okay, we had this American dominionist ideology that said the earth is here for us. It is here for us to um, use for what we wanted to use it for. Except, um, you know, by around 1850, you looked around and uh, stuff is just gone, it is stripped away, right? And so, so federal agencies realize like, we cannot have completely unbridled development, that there have to be some controls on this. And so that's sort of how some of these agencies like the BLM were born out of the need to um, not just go 100% apeshit on um, uh, resources like, you know, like grass, right? Like timber uh, and so on. Um, where you have ecological considerations that come into play for these agencies, they come up in the environmental movement of the 60s and 70s. And if you think about the kind of raison d'etre behind some of these agencies that is now 150 years old, think of that as a granite stone and this stuff is carved into it uh, in terms of managing for the benefit of um, American industry. Uh, environmental ecological considerations are a post-it note that's kind of stuck on to the to the granite. Um, it is at best layered on. It has even today um, has not fully been integrated into the uh, operations and expectations of, of these uh, resource management agencies. Um, industry capture, does everybody know what the Iron Triangle is all about? The Iron Triangle. Um, it is um, the relationship, it describes the relationship between industry, say beef and cattle, um, or copper or timber, the relationship between that industry, between federal regulators, and between Congress. Um, so this triangle um, uh, in which, in, in a lot of cases, there is a revolving door where the industry captains become regulators, become senators, right, and they go back and forth, and it's this love fest um, in which they are, they are creating regulations and legislating for the benefits of their own industries. Um, the Lords of Yesterday, have you heard of the Lords of Yesterday? Those, again, sort of the, the, the leaders in copper mining, in timber harvesting, in grazing, um, 
are still driving, these are the people driving law enforcement management um, today. Even as the West has changed so much socially, um, this is the politics that prevails. Um, environmental uh, policy researchers are the ones who tell us, um, uh, and they try not to do it too smugly, that Deb Haaland was always going to disappoint us. Um, that was never going to be, um, was never going to be an option that she would surprise us all by um, protecting wild horses because of the resilience of the, the, the sort of the, the just basic fundamental purposes of these agencies. Um, I think the folks in this field will suggest that there is some potential from um, movements like PEER, the um, Public Employees for Environmental Responsibility, but again, they are up against a very durable and resilient historical legacy. Um, so biopolitics bio um, is um, sort of a concept, um, a concept that is about the laws, the regulations, the policies and practices that decide who lives and who dies. It is kind of a high stakes concept. Um, who do we bestow value upon and who do we believe is disposable? Um, I, it's, it's about the, the, the regulation and risks associated with living organisms. Um, I think deer are a great example. Think of how we think about deer as risks. Lyme disease, car collisions. I live not too far from Valley Forge National Park where the, the identity of the white-tailed deer is the destroyer of the forest understory. Um, so biopolitics describes the kinds of risks that are posed by, um, by organisms and it sorts them into categories, valuable or not, killable or not, native or not, welcome or not. You are going to notice that some of the organisms that get sorted in the, the framing of biopolitics are humans. Um, think of the way that we think of certain humans that get sorted as unwanted, <coughs> as risks, as dangers. Um, so in terms of horses, I think horses, you know, on paper are protected from killing, but we know what that looks like. We know what the slaughter pipeline looks like, but on paper, we're not supposed to kill them. They are subject to removal and detention. Um, you know, Krishna and I think about that as detainability. Um, in the wild horse landscape, um, it is the concept of biopolitics that powers the wild horse economy of detention. Um, so think about the current wild horse man management regime. In a lot of ways, it is more or less a mechanism for transforming public resources into private wealth because we're sort of paying private contractors to warehouse the horses, um, removing competition for every blade of grass um, on behalf of, of um, grazing leaseholders. Biopolitics provides the justification for that, um, that kind of wealth shift. Like, like, you know, how we talk about feral cats is another one, uh, right? Feral cats as um, I literally I was talking to a, um, an ornithologist, a colleague, uh, last week, um, who was kind of talking to my my students, um, who was who was saying um, feral cats like the number one uh, risk to birds. And I was thinking like I, I feel like habitat loss is in there somewhere, but um, cats, cats, legit cats. Um, are problematic in island uh, ecosystems, et cetera. Um, but, right, that, so that's the framing, an organism that is a risk and therefore gets a label of killable or not, sortable or not. Massification is another term we use here. When you think of a whole population of organisms rather than as a collective of individuals, right? So biopolitics and, and the massification that um, is the follow-on concept denies, for wild horses, denies their personhood, denies that they have families and, and experience um, a, a sort of an emotionally rich life. So, so that, those kinds of 
concepts enable a regime of rounding up and removing. So where researchers like Krishna and I step in, um, it's into the field of human animal studies, which is an answer, it's a challenge to um, that rangeland management science and a challenge to um, the, the, the kind of cold classifications that biopolitics puts down um, on, on horses. Um, so in human animal studies, we are not thinking about the biology of the organism. We're not thinking about its place in evolution. Um, we think about the relationships that they embody, um, political, economic, cultural, between humans and non-human animals. Um, I, I have a good example of the kinds of human animal research questions or projects that get asked. I think about um, a really great example is Rafi Uot's work. So Rafi, um, does some great work on rats. Um, he looks at how rats are embodied in completely different roles, depending on where and how you encounter them. Like think about the different identities of the rat. It's a pest. It's a stand in for humans at the same time, right? In biomedical research. Um, rats are pets that are beloved. Rats are heroes when they sniff out landmines. Um, rats are all of these things. They, they sort of embody these different roles depending on where they are. Um, and, and Rafi does some kind of really amazing work of, of, in teasing this out. And actually that project um, um, grew out of work that Rafi did on um, the rats' practices of boundary violations in that um, same symposium, symposium on animals and borders that Christian and I wrote the Bastique Pony paper um, on. Um, the thing about human animal studies as a field that's really important is that it rejects the idea of human exceptionalism and anthropocentrism, the idea that only humans do this or only humans do that. Only humans experience a full range of emotions. Only humans have language. Um, this is backed up in the, you know, in the, in the science. I think of researchers like, like Franz de Waal um, is, a, is a, I think one of the more prominent um, scientists who has been reminding us for a few decades now that humans are not the only um, animals with language. We're not the only animals who experience emotions, um, who, who grieve, um, who love their families, um, who are curious, who experience fear and joy. Um, in human animal studies, we treat um, animals as subjects rather than as objects um, and to sort of explain a little bit about what that means because this is a little bit of kind of insider baseball lingo perhaps um, think about mm, remember how we diagram sentences in school there's a subject and an object to a sentence an object is acted upon a subject does right so subjects have agency um, subjects act um, they are, they, we think of them as political actors and agents. Um, while objects are things that just are recipients of um, actions by humans, right? Um, you know, in my multi-species art thing, what we really tried to tease out was the idea of speaking about animals, speaking for animals, or expressing with, right? And, and the idea of see, seeing and listening um, to animals as political um, actors. Um, and I, I want to note that I think uh, is a ginger who's doing a presentation this, this week on, on witnessing roundups and um, that, that sort of the, the political act of witnessing and grieving is a really important concept that comes out of human animal studies. Um, so it doesn't just accept that there are um, practices that exploit non-human animals, everything from eating them to um, killing all the cane toads uh, in Australia, right? So it, um, it questions and challenges and politicizes those kinds of decisions. Um, and in terms of the people doing this research, there actually is a lot of overlap. A lot of the folks doing the scholarship, you will also find them in the animal rights and animal liberation movements. Um, I think bottom line in human animal studies is that we are 
looking for um, arguments that can support um, these very sort of rich and multi-layered conceptions of multi-species flourishing about seeing humans and animals as being on the same team as rather than in opposition or as one just subject to the exploitation um, of the other. Um, compassionate conservation is um, a, another kind of um, place where um, we, are, we are challenging notions of biopolitics. There's actually kind of a low-key war going on in the academic literature between traditional field ecologists and folks who are taking a compassionate conservation approach. Um, the traditional scientists accuse the compassionate conservation head, uh, conservationists of being just kind of fuzzy-headed and naive, um, while the compassionate conservationists are pointing out things like a personal toll that the practice of like, we're gonna kill 500 cormorants today um, to protect this fishery can take on the people doing that research. Um, compassionate conservation is a framework in conservation research that draws our attention to like, what's going wrong with traditional conservation practices. It views um, animals like horses as deserving of our moral concern. Um, it, it, it pushes back against that idea of massification and the whole population approach to conservation science. And it especially challenges practices of killing to conserve. Um, the thing that, you know, compassionate conservation doesn't deny the damage that like a lot of feral cats can do in Hawaii. Um, but they're also, there are also things, you know, sort of reminding us that ecological purity as a concept, um, it doesn't exist and it cannot exist in, in the Anthropocene, right? This is sort of age um, of sort of those profound changes that humans have had on, on the planet. There, there literally are no ecosystems left on Earth that have not been changed by human industrial activity. There aren't any, you cannot name one. Um, I mean, the, the molten core of the Earth isn't an ecosystem. Um, so what we think of today as untrammeled ecosystems, right, it just amounts to like basically what guys like Aldo Leopold saw when they, you know, like they popped around and, and sort of took notes in their journals describing what animals were present in Nebraska in 1831. Um, can we, we can't stuff the toothpaste back in the tube essentially is what compassionate conservations are saying, conservationists are saying. Um, and they are asking how can we balance ecosystem protection with humane, uh, humane approaches that honor uh, the personhood of non-human animals. Moving along. Oops. There we go. Um, feminist science studies takes a kind of gendered approach. It, 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 it looks at um, how ideas and assumptions about gender interact with um, science and technology. So coming back to rangeland science, um, this is that moment where I like literally started yelling at Christian while I was reading um, an article written by, I wanna say Davies and Boyd out of the USDA Research Station in Burns, Oregon. Um, they, were, they wrote a paper that is extremely typical of rangeland science management uh, literature about wild horses. There are a problem, there are solutions. We could feed them to condors. We could slaughter them and get some money for them. These are rational things, right? Except, except that those wild horse ladies are so hard, they're just, they're just rich. <laughs> like this is the, like the literature of, of, of wild horse management. Um, that is, I call it undisguised contempt. Um, and, and, and this is a male dominated profession that is considering how it feels about the very women dominated um, world of wild horse advocacy. Right, so back to Burns, Oregon. Boyd and Davies write in a paper, they published it, I wanna say it's 2018 or 19. Do you all know where Burns is? Yeah. Where's Burns located? Oregon. What's it near? The middle of nowhere. 
Thank you. Who said Mallard? <laughs> um, when I when I reverse engineered when they must have been writing this paper based on the publication date, thinking about uh, how long does the peer review process take? When did they probably finish it? They probably finished it around 2017 or 18. What happened in Eastern Oregon in 20? I wonder was it 16? What happened oh, at the wildlife about the Bundy, yeah. Public lands ranchers yeah. violently took over a federal facility. Yeah. These guys are literally 30 miles away going like, man, that's crazy wild horse ladies. You can't get anything done with them around. Um, and the violence of the public lands ranchers, which is a history that goes back a um, hundred or more years to the range wars. Like there's just this consistent violence, emotional, may I say, um, tantrums being thrown by public lands ranchers. That emotional. It's emotional, yeah. That is invisible to the researchers who are thinking about the stakeholders. Um, and so as an STS person, this just like jumped out and punched me in the face. Um, anyway, so um, ecofeminism, critiques that liberal autonomous subject that kind of came out of you know, enlightenment philosophy. Um, the, the, the sort of, and I, and I don't mean American politics of conservative and liberal, like I mean kind of the, the idea of the liberal autonomous human as being separate from its environment or his or her environment. Um, Ecofeminism tries to kind of reconnect humans as contextualized in their environment. It listens to the remote, is what we call. Um, the remote are vulnerable beings, essentially. Um, and vulnerability in terms of life on our planet crosses um, from humans to non-humans, right? So there is a shared vulner vulnerability, in, in other words, that ecofeminism pays attention to. I don't want to equate this with um, that kind of bioessentialist feminism that sort of thinks about like, because you're women, you have this kind of nurturing approach to the earth, like that's completely separate from that, but it, it really thinks in a very critical way about shared vulnerabilities. And when we think about horses in the remote, like think about the places where horses are. So it's feminist scholars who are very sensitized um, to, to, to these shared vulnerabilities. Um, and, you know, sort of from a, in terms of when we talk about wild horses, um, it means honoring the lives and experiences of both horses and honoring the knowledge and experience of advocates who are essentially experts uh, about the horses. And one of the other things about rangeland science is that it, 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 it bemoans the lack of solid empirical data about the lives of wild horses today with no um, recognition whatsoever of all the advocacy groups that have trail camps set up all over the HMAs at the, you know, where they provision with water. All of you who spend time um, watching and observing wild horses are sources of data that rangeland scientists just like don't even acknowledge, right? So, so that there's a real disconnect there. Um, Mobility studies, I think this is um, where I wrap it up. Um, mobility studies is um, social science that thinks about movement. Like it says, how bodies move, ideas, products, objects move, uh, move uh, in all kinds of ways um, around the globe, from one part of a city to another, how ideas move from people to other people. Um, where this has um, come into play in our work um, is in that paper we wrote about climate change and, and HMAs um, with plant and animal communities on the move. Horses are not, horses cannot migrate to find better ecological conditions, which makes them really vulnerable. Water moves. Think about water that's trucked in to HMAs. Um, and at the state of Arizona is like, you know, every summer doing water drops to keep wildlife alive, right? Water is moved out of HMAs um, into, um, you know, from aquifers to water or broccoli fields in the Imperial Valley of California. Um, 
So it, it also shows up in our study of the well burrows in Moreno Valley, um, where speed and pace are important factors in how and whether a convivial multi-species community can emerge from place. Um, a great <coughs> researcher named Diane Micklefelder talks about not just multi-species relationship needing space, but also needing time. Um, you need time literally to be able to see and recognize other beings, um, to, to understand them as potential fellow travelers. You have to pause and give that time. Um, and we saw this come out in a different geographies of Riverside County, where in the, sub, so in the sort of subdivision neighborhoods of Moreno Valley, where car speeds are slow, um, people have time, like the boroughs are not in an imminent danger of being run over, right? And people have time to en enjoy or, or just sort of cheerfully complain about the, the boroughs pooping uh, all over their yards and absolutely wrecking um, their shrubberies. In fact, our, our paper, by the way, is called Pooped in My Yard and Ate My Grass Last Night. <laughs> <laughs> Tales of Belonging in, in Riverside County. So by contrast, the, the high-speed arterial road um, traversing Ritchie Canyon um, is all about biopolitics and the risks. It's high speed, boroughs are getting run over, people are dying, and, it, and the, the politics there, just a mile away from Sunny Me Ranch subdivision, it's about how do we remove the burrows from the road, right? Removal and detention. So that's um, where I am gonna wrap it. So that's just kind of a roundup, if you will, um, of some of the concepts from social science, sciences and humanities that, that, we, that has informed my research, the research that I do with Christian, and that I think may have um, something to say about advocacy strategies, um, but sort of, Kind of at the at the at the heart of this, we are working on um, building the social sciences of wild horses and creating a, an academic literature that that can, like you get with birds or with lizards or fish, um, that can contribute to um, wild horse protection. On the tables, um, I left a. a a piece of paper that looks like this. But look, I'm a sustainability professional. I wasn't gonna print these out. Um, this is uh, our bibliography. This is sort of a, it's a, it's a slice of a bibliography. So I, we, 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 um, we put together a bunch of sources that we feel from environmental policy, lots from human animal studies. There's some ecofeminism work in there, some abilities, um, sources that you might be interested in checking out and getting a sense of, it's like a three page long bibliography, very little of which is specifically about horses, but right, this is the work that we draw from to extrapolate into horses. So you can use your phone to follow the QR code. Uh, it's a Google Doc and there's also a, a URL that will also get you there. So I left one of these um, per table. Um, feel free to check that out. It's academic research, some of it's behind a paywall, some of it is free access. If you bump into an article that you really wanna check out but you don't have access to, there are a couple ways to get around that you can check with your public library. Um, or if you are, if you live near um, a land grant university or a public university, they can help you get access to it. Also, I can help you get access to it um, through um, my, my university's library and I can download and share any of these articles with you, just get in touch. There's our emails. You can also find me on social media. Um, yeah, what's next? We're not sure what's next. We just uh, submitted a paper yesterday. We got another one coming up. Um, we have an invitation to Australia this fall um, where the Australian Political Science Association and the Australasian Animal Studies Association are doing a joint meeting. So a lot of the people who are in our bibliography are gonna be there, um, and we feel like we wanna be there. So I don't know, we're kind of thinking, wondering whether there is a possible collaboration with some Australian um, wild horse researchers afoot, maybe. We'll see what happens. Let me stop there and see if anyone has questions. I'll do my best. Again, my political theorist isn't here today, but we'll see. Yeah. Um, so I was just, uh, had come across a video 
four ranchers, they're part of the BLM. And 